it, everybody. You got to get on your feet for this one. It's a clapping song for sure. Clap, clap. This will wake you up. We're going to worship the Lord together. Hallelujah.
But we find in this Christmas season that on a Sunday morning, we can't even get to all of our favorite Christmas carols. <laughs> There's just so many. And so we've got this beautiful little medley of songs, and, and you're still supposed to be singing. I just want to encourage you. It's going to look like maybe you're not, but I need you. <laughs> from heaven 
Dan and Brennan, hop up. We've got special music for you guys today. Sing. invitation. Well, welcome. We're so glad that you've come and joined with us today as we are worshiping Jesus. Uh, you know, Christmas isn't about just the birthday of a baby. It's a birthday of a man, the God-man, who became flesh. And, you know, I don't know, uh, we might look back to the day that each of us were born when we have celebrations of the birthdays, put more candles on. There's no way we could, how do, you, how do you put infinity candles on from way back when? He's always been the one who's the light of the world. 
Christmas is a joyful time of coming together, a time of fellowship with family and friends. For most of you, you're here because you have a standing invitation to worship each Sunday. But while others, some of you, you're visiting and you're here at the invitation of someone to come for today. And either way, we're just glad that you're here. Today, I would submit that Christmas is itself an invitation, an invitation for relationship with God, an overture, a reaching out and saying, come to me. That's what the Father says. Christmas is a personal invitation for each one of us, and it's an invitation to again have relationship with God. Originally, Man had relationship in the Garden of Eden. In the cool of the day, we, they would spend time together. And imagine how sweet that would be, just to be able to walk in the cool of the day with, with God. And, and not, no, no interference of the sinfulness of flesh or a, a little bit of shame. Or, well, what did I do last week? Or maybe even on the way to church, all right? Uh, a totally clear conscience unstained by the knowledge of sin. Oh, it was wonderful. But wouldn't you know, we were true, pure as the driven snow, but we drifted, wouldn't you know? Every one of us, in some way, have been bad on our own. But it all started when humanity, who was given opportunity for uninhibited relationship with God, chose himself over God. Whenever we choose self over God, relationship is blocked. A while back, as we did the communion service, we were talking about the fact that we need to make sure that we are, have a clear conscience before God because sin can cloud our connection with him. We were in the, in the men's meeting that we were uh, listening to, Kingdom Men, I encourage you men to show up for that. It's called Kingdom Men, Every Man's Destiny and Every Woman's Dream. So women, you can actually untuck your elbows here and give you permission to poke your husband and say, why don't you go over and listen to see what it's all about. But while uh, Tony Evans was speaking, he ended up alluding to something. If you are not treating your wife respectfully, and yet you aren't in correct relationship with them, your prayers are hindered. So anything that we allow to come between God and us hinders the intimate relationship that he desires from us. But in spite of all of our sin, we are fatally flawed. So he sent Jesus an invitation for restored relationship with him. He came and took our place and paid the price. All throughout history, ever since Adam and Eve sinned, the prophets would again and again remind us who were languishing in our, our sin that there was going to come a Messiah, someone who would free us. And we didn't know what that looked like. We didn't know what to expect. We have some expectations that sometimes have us miss what God's doing. Even right now in our country, you may think, wow, I had an expectation that we might be able to uh, push forward and, and have uh, good laws put into place. And I'm not going to get all political, but I know that in this building right now, there's a lot of disappointment with the trajectory and what we have chosen to go, the direction as a nation. But sometimes it seems like a loss in God's economy sets us up for a victory. Certainly when Jesus died on the cross, it seemed like a total loss, right? Oh, it's all over, all the hope was gone. But in the loss, it allowed the Son of God to reveal his plan for the redemption. So do not place your eyes on this world's kingdom and believe that just because short-term victories, uh, losses, 
mean that the battle is done. We have a, a spiritual call to present Jesus to the world. And right now, in this very devastating time, we have an opportunity to put the joy of the Lord on our face and in our heart and speak of his love and walk out of here saying, praise the Lord, we are following Jesus. So I, I just, just because it seems like things aren't working out the way you thought it should go doesn't mean it isn't the way God says is the way forward. So the prophets of old were telling people that there was going to come a Messiah, an invitation of restored relationship. The prophet Isaiah prophesied this, and, and in Matthew it is referenced in Matthew 1, verse 23, and it says, Behold, a virgin shall become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us, restored relationship. An invitation is an intentional request to come and join in a celebration or an event. It's asking someone to participate in something special or significant. It's an honor to be invited to a wedding or a, or a dinner. It says that you're valued. Uh, I've officiated at a number of weddings, and, and I've gone to a number of them, and, and that typically I would get a invitation to go to it and naturally I would plan if I was officiating I would be planning on going whether I received the invitation or not and and if you're in relationships with your families and and friends it can be assumed that that you're probably going to go right if it's a close relationship you don't need a formal invitation to feel welcomed my kids are going to come over for dinner today and I'm not sending them a formal invitation. But if I were to invite one of you to our Christmas dinner, I would send you some kind of a clear invitation, whether it be on the phone or an email or a text or something that says, would you please be our guest? I would make it very clear. With this in mind, consider the various invitations that were given to Jesus' birth and the type of invitation that was sent to various people, representatives on this earth who needed saving. We're going to start with a familiar passage in Matthew 2, verse 1 through 12. We're just going to go through this. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is he who is born king of the Jews? We saw a star when it rose and have come to worship him. All right? Now, kids, I want you to think, what is the invitation? See if you can catch it as we go. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called them together, all the people, chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them, where the Messiah was to be born. So Herod did not get a formal invitation that these wise men got. Children, what was the invitation the signaling them to come to Bethlehem? Who knows? A star. A star. A single star in the sky. And they understood because it was sent to them. God sends us invitations that are personal, that we can relate to. Each one of us, at one time in our life, received an invitation from God into relationship. And it was very personal. He knew you and knew how to communicate to you that he was calling, inviting you to come. Herod did not pick up on this. And so he was saying, how does this work? So let's go on. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written in Micah 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So these wise men who were scanning the stars 
understanding that to them, that's where they were looking. It, wasn't, it was their inbox, all right? The stars was their inbox. Talk about a message in the cloud, right? <laughs> then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. So he sort of sneaking, hacking in to find out. I want to access. I want to know too. But he had different motives, right, kids? He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Yeah, that's going to happen. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen, when it rose, went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. The star, the invitation, even gave place and time. Amazing. And when they saw the star, or the invitation, they were overjoyed on coming to the house. And they saw the child and the mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. They then opened their treasures and presented him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Did you know that God communicates to us in various ways? Even, it says, the, that old men dream dreams. You know that scripture? Yeah. Uh, they must have been old. And later on, I'm going to share something that the Lord spoke to me in a dream about this message. It's interesting how God can, knows how to address something specifically to you. The wise men, or magi, were scholars, they were astrologers. And they likely came from Babylon or Persia. And remember back in 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had conquered Israel and taken many into captivity, including Daniel. And Daniel, who knew the Hebrew scriptures well, had become a respected wise man, a magi in some way at the courts of Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus. And if you want to look it up, it's in Daniel 2, 45, and Daniel 6, verse 28. The influence of Daniel, this wisest of the counselors, as well as Mordecai and Esther, that was also, back then, part of the tapestry, part of the history of these magi from the, from the east. The influence of Daniel as well as Mordecai and Esther was profound and long-lasting. It was part of their history. These wise men would surely have become familiar with the biblical prophecy. I love the one in Numbers 24, 17 through 19. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter, talking about rule and authority, shall rise out of Israel, out of Jacob, we're narrowing it down, not just Israel, out of Jacob shall come he who shall have dominion. These wise men, men of influence who understood the, the, the courts of power, though they had power, there was something that they were searching for. They had everything this world had to offer. They were royalty. But in searching the heavens, they became aware that there was the fingerprints of God on his creation. And it pointed to, well, who made it? Who made these stars? How does it, how does the orbits and, and the movement of the constellations, how does that so consistently move they were wise enough to understand that they needed to continue to search. So they were hungry, and I'm sure that even in their, in their relationships between the people of his day, they saw the brokenness, and they were looking for a royalty beyond the seats of power in this age. They were looking and expecting from what they had read in the Hebrew Scriptures and 
what they had seen in the stars. They were expecting and looking for a king, waiting for a sign in the heavens, as it were, an invitation, scanning the night skies, looking for that which was promised. The invitation that these wise men received was a single star. That's pretty amazing, a star. Well, contrast that for a moment to the extravagant, over-the-top personal invitation that the shepherds received to come and to the place and see the Christ child on the night he was born. Can you imagine? Contrast that. One star. It, it, it's nice to notice a star if you're looking for it, right? But these shepherds, they were not the top of the heap. They were not royalty. There were people who were not looking for a star or searching the heavens at night. They were shivering in the darkness, cold, feeling like they're working the graveyard shift. Everyone else in town was having a Christmas party. No, not yet. <laughs> Everyone else was at home, snug in their beds, waiting for... No, they were, were out there in the field, freezing. And looking up once in a while, oh, that's right, there's a shooting star, and, and, uh, but oblivious. But God saw their need, and they needed a Savior just like the wise men did. And he wanted to make sure it was real personal what happened in Bethlehem. Let's read what happened. While they, Mary and Joseph, were there in the stable in Bethlehem, the days were complete. For her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. And she wrapped him in cloths. And laid him in a manger. Because there was no room for them in the inn. These shepherds, they're just out there oblivious. There were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields. Living there. Keeping watch over their flock by night. Wow. And all of a sudden something happened. That, whoa, what's happening and the angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. They were terribly frightened, and the angel said to them, do not be afraid. Talk about getting afraid. I mean, can you imagine an explosion in the sky in the darkness, and then an angel speaking out of that, do not be afraid, give me a break. No. For behold, I bring to you good news of great joy, which shall be to all people, not just kings, the lowest of lows, the people who were forgotten. They weren't thinking about them. The only one remembering them was their moms. For there is born to you, you shepherds, this day in the city of David, a Savior, a Savior for them who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You'll find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in the manger. See, God has given clear instructions as to where the invitation says to go. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, let's say it together, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Oh, you can have peace today. You can have joy. You have been invited by God to have relationship with him. We don't have to have an angelic choir because we have the history. We have all of the prophets and Jesus coming and we have this record and we have our own invitation that God spoke to you individually, some of you a long time ago and you've been following that star for a long time and you will someday see him face to face. So let's keep reading. When the angel had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing. They didn't say, oh, this is awesome. We got an invitation to go. I'll, I'll, I'll put that on my windowsill, an invitation, and go about their day. They had to do something with the invitation that God 
had given the instructions on how to go and see. So they said, let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us, the invitation we received. Let's go and respond. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word. It reminds me of the song, Go Tell It On the Mount. Ah, you know, when you have seen Jesus, when you've encountered him, it makes you want to go tell everybody, right? But they spread the word concerning what they had been told about the child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all the things and pondered them in her heart. Mary had expectations as to what was going to happen, right? She had had angelic visitations telling her why, this, why she was going to have a pregnancy without having known a man. And all of the shame that was going to happen. And God visited Joseph, who was apparently a little older than a young man, in a dream. And told him also that he, this was a God thing. Her pregnancy was divine intervention in this world. This was the Messiah, the long-awaited one. That all the young Jewish girls who had studied the, the scriptures thought, maybe I will be the mother of the Messiah. Oh. But Mary, thinking about all that had transpired, and now even this, pondered, why in the world is this happening? I thought the Messiah would be something that would come on with a huge spectacle for the whole world to see, not just a few shepherds. They were smelly. They came here. They, and I'm in a barn. Give me a break. This isn't a, even a birthing room. This is a barn. How does this fit into God's plan? I, I heard what God said, but it looks like it's not coming out the way he planned. If this is a plan for a birthday party, it's a failure. All right, all that showed up were the shepherds, and they didn't bring food, no gifts. Well, okay, she pondered. We sanitized this story. I'm sorry. The, the, the plan of salvation unraveling in our lives is not a picture book the way it pops out on our cards on Christmas or hangs above our trees. That is not the way it unfolded. There was all kinds of oh, expectation. Boom. Oh, this is God's answer. Boom. In your own life right now, God's leading you to do things, telling you to do things, and you have an expectation on the short term, but God's playing a long-term goal. It's not only about you. It's about the whole world that he loves. And he wants to bring this world's systems down like he says it's going to come. Down to the point where there will be a Messiah who shows up. And that Messiah does not have a name or yellow hair. Can I have an amen? And Lord, bless all those in areas of leadership in this world right now. I pray, God, that the King of Kings would be revealed to them, that they, you would bring them to their knees in their realizing the, that, that aside from a God intervention, all is lost. But we have a God intervention because we have a God who loves each one of us and has a plan for us individually. And I pray, Lord, you would do that in this country, that there would be a great revival, a great ingathering in the middle of darkness. In the name of Jesus. Mary pondered all those things in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. And I encourage you to continue to praise God and worship Him because He has a plan and it is an eternal plan.
The invitation that the shepherds received was a, a choir of angels. That is so much more over the top than the wise men who were the rulers of this age. The shepherds were at the bottom of society's social circles. And so they needed a more compelling and overt, a obvious, this isn't a mistake. You didn't get this invitation by mistake. God wants you. God wanted them to know that they were invited to his party. It was more compelling than the wise men. Because they needed it. And some of us might feel like, you know what? God doesn't see me. I'm struggling. I'm a nobody. God isn't really talking to me. He is talking to you. Today, he is talking to you. He did this elaborate display for the shepherds so that you would know that the lowest echelons of society are important to him. In fact, he focuses on those who need help. He says this, the sick are the ones that need a doctor. And I tell you what, all of us in some ways, the wealthiest to the poorest, are sick with sin. And we needed a savior. And God wanted to make sure that they understood. And this is what 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 29 says, that reinforces this. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in this world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose the things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. But he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised of this world. Things counted as nothing at all. And used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. Remember that. That is God's economy. And that's his focus. He loves to bring the, the weak to a place of strength. So that we can say, through him I am strong. A while back I taught on the message of the life I now live. And it is the life of letting Christ be seen in me. Counting my old life dead. Not relying on my own strength. But relying on him. The risen one to be living through me. That is God's plan. It has been for eternity. To count things that as nothing at all. And use them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of the Lord. I've heard that wise men still seek him. But often the, the A-listers of this world miss it. They take their invitations and they lay them off to one side. Says, oh, that's good. I'll have to pay attention to that sometime when I have a little bit of time. They're too busy seeking the things that are up below. Too busy with other things. And here comes a dream that I ended up having a while back. And it was thinking about the invitation and the complacency of not responding to God's invitation. Complacency. This is what the Holy Spirit I believe, spoke to me in a dream. Do not let complacency be your response to God's invitation to come to the place and see. I heard that quite often we put off, ah, oh, it's not a priority. I'll get to that. I'll, 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 come, to a, a, I'll come and see you, Lord. I will, I will move your way and look for you at another time. Do not let complacency be your response to God's invitation to come to the place and see. And the place where there's hope is Jesus. There's a story that Jesus told a parable that reinforces this. It's in Luke 14, 16 through 24. Then he, Jesus said, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many and sent his servants 
at supper time to say to those who were invited, come for all the things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. They had the invitation, but they had other things they were doing. Their life was just fine. They had no urgent need to go and see, to come and feed, to look to God who gives life eternally. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must go and see. I ask you to have me excused. And another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to test them. Oh, I just bought this car and I'm up for a test ride. Man, I'm, I'm, this is awesome. I'm going to see how this guy, this thing flies. Oh, it's awesome. Well, that's today's uh, version of it. I ask you to have me excused. And another said, I've married a wife and therefore cannot come. You married the wrong wife then. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Your wife will say, eh, you got to go and follow God, right? You wives, of course, that's what you're saying, right? It's not follow me, it's follow Christ. You'll gladly follow a man who's following Christ, right? Amen. amen. Let's have an amen from that. Amen. Hallelujah, I thought so. One said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. What do we do? We got the food spread. Then the master of the house, this is God speaking. It's in a... a a story that represents what will come. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servants, Whoa, oh God, becoming angry? Do you know that if you set, if he, you prepare a huge meal and you've invited people and they, they did not tell you, they didn't even respond, they didn't RSVP, and then when, you, when the day came, no one showed? Most women... And guys who are helping the wives with the supper would go, you know what, honey, calm down. Don't get so angry. But they didn't even respond. Well, I'll tell you what, the God of the universe who has prepared a feast for us, and if we don't even respond, I'll tell you what, we can get his anger up. Then the master of the house being angry said to his servants, Go out quickly into the streets and into the city and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you have commanded. And still there is room. Thank you, Jesus. Then the master said to the servants, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited We'll taste my supper. Is that harsh? Complacency is the thing that says, I'll put that off for a little bit later. And it can be destructive. The parable foreshadows, foreshadows a more joyful event than even the first Christmas. It says in Revelation 19, verse 2, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You are invited. And today an invitation is extended to you to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The marriage supper of the Lamb that we are invited to is us going to His heavenly home. Not, not Him coming to this world but making a way for us to go to his. It is awesome. And I don't want you to miss it in all the glitter and the glamour of this season which has a tendency to distract us from what it's all about. Hebrews 2 verse 6 says this, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. Why? For the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor so that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Hebrews 2, verse 9. <laughs> he became like us so that we could become 
as he is. His death made available eternal life for us. What an exchange. But just being aware of this invitation, just having read it is not enough. You must respond and receive him as the Lord and Savior of your life. Hebrews 2, 1 and 3. The verse right before it says this. For this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. Are you paying attention to the invitation that God has given each one of us? From the kings to the lowest. And in verse 3, it says, the ominous warning. In some way, it, it, it echoes back to the parable of the anger that God has for those who squander and ignore what he has offered. And it says, how can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation. How can we escape? So again, I present to you God's loving invitation for God so loved the world. And he's sending this to you. You. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The invitation and how do we receive that? It's in John 1, verse 12. As many as received him. That's not just okay to visit on Sunday mornings. It's receive him into your heart and say, I open my life to you. I lay my life down. I give it because I have nothing that I could give to the king of kings except for my life. For as many as received him to them, to you, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. You're invited. You have an invitation. I want us to stand up today. I want you to bow your heads, not look around. I don't know whether you uh, have left your invitation un RSVP'd. If you have not responded to God's invitation for relationship, but I challenge you right now, today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. And if you want to have the best Christmas you could ever experience, Receive the gift he offers to you. Eternal life. By receiving Jesus into your heart. Making him Lord of your life. If you've never done that before. You might have known all about the invitation. You could quote these verses. But you haven't given him your all. I challenge you to now make a decision. Don't be complacent and put it off. I'll do it later. It can have devastating consequences. I want you with every head bowed and eye closed. If you are making that decision today that you've weighed it out, you see the trajectory of this world and you've seen the trajectory of your life and you say, do you know what? I want to have a great exchange. I want Jesus to come and live in me and, and, and I, give me a hope and a future. If you would like to do that, put your hand up right now. It is my assumption that, of course, none would be so foolish as to ignore such a great salvation. So my challenge is to go, tell it on the mountains, go tell it in any way that you can proclaim Jesus as Lord. Be bold. We're living in a time when Christians need to be bold. And so, I pray that you have a Merry Christmas and may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you.
may the Lord cause his face to shine on you. <laughs> because it is. He, the light of the world is shining on you. And give you his peace. The Prince of Peace offers it. And please walk in the strength and peace and joy of the Lord. I hope you've enjoyed this. To hear other messages by Calvin Bergsma, go to facebook.com forward slash GCF Church or youtube.com forward slash GCF Messages. You may also follow Georgetown Christian Fellowship with our app. Go to either iOS or the Play Store for Android and search for Word Server. That's one word, Word Server. And install the free application. There you will get all of our messages, including the streaming capability. 